to Healthy Births, Happy Babies, where we share tips, tools, and stories grounded in natural childbirth and parenting principles, so that instead of feeling overwhelmed and confused during this exciting time in your life, you feel safe, supported, and empowered in your childbirth and parenting journey. And now, here's your host, Dr. Jay Warren. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Healthy Births, Happy Babies. I'm Dr. Jay Warren. I'm the prenatal and pediatric chiropractor here at the Cap Wellness Center. And today's guest is Dr. Stuart Fishbein. He is a practicing OBGYN up in LA, and he is also a fellow podcaster. He has a great podcast called Dr. Stu's Podcast. You can check that out on iTunes. And he's here today to share his journey of how after 28 years as a practicing OBGYN delivering babies in a hospital setting, he has switched to more of a midwifery care in recent years and is assisting on home births. He's very passionate about really trying to shift the paradigm of pregnancy and birth from a disease model, a medicalized model, into a wellness model and having women be supported in the natural mammalian physiological birth process that it is. He has a lot to share, but before I switch over to our conversation, let me take a moment, as always, to share a message from our sponsor, the Cap Wellness Center. Hi, I'm Marin Higa, and I'm the acupuncturist at Cap Wellness Center. One of the things I love about working at Cap Wellness Center is getting to be around all the brave, strong, and inspiring women. I'm always inspired by my patients' ability to rise to their challenges, overcome obstacles, and also get creative in their pursuit towards their health goals. I feel honored to be a part of their journey, whether it's helping them to start a family, have a healthy pregnancy, or helping them through their postpartum recovery. All right, and please note, too, that you can send your questions or comments to our email address at info at capwellnesscenter.com, or you can reach us through our Facebook page at the Cap Wellness Center. And, of course, I would love it for you to rate and review the podcast in iTunes if you haven't already, if you're enjoying the show. Uh, that really helps us expand our reach in iTunes, and I would really appreciate that. And also, I'd love to hear your feedback. So now let me introduce to you Dr. Stu. As I said, Dr. Stuart Fishbein is a practicing OBGYN in the Los Angeles area, a lecturer, and also the published author of Fearless Pregnancy, Wisdom and Reassurance from a Doctor, Midwife, and Mom, and also Home Birth with an Obstetrician, a series of 135 out-of-hospital births. He's an outspoken advocate of informed decision-making, the midwifery model of care, and human rights in childbirth, receiving the 2016 Most Audacious Award from the HRI and the Association for Holistic Newborn Health. He shares his thoughts and advocacy for evidence-based reasonable choices on his podcast, Dr. Stu's podcast, and now he works directly with home birthing midwives, offering hope for those women who cannot find supportive practitioners for VBAC, twin, and breech deliveries. So now let me switch over to my conversation with Dr. Stu. All right, Dr. Stu, welcome to the podcast. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jay. It's a pleasure to be here. I've uh, followed your podcast, and I know about your partner, Dr. Cap. And uh, um, it's funny how we all have like single moniker names, but that's the way it goes these days. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> well, I've been a fan of your podcast as well for a long time. I appreciate the work that you're doing and um, putting out there. But today I wanted to um, have our listeners really hear your message, if they're, if they're not familiar with your podcast, um, you practice as an OB, but then also working very strongly with the midwifery uh, community and doing a lot of home birth now. So before we jump into all of those uh, kind of topics, we already heard your bio on the front part of the episode, but give us a little context about how you got started in obstetrics and led you to where you are today. Okay, well, I know we're in limited time, but I'll just, I'll just give you a brief overview. Um, my third year of medical school, I did a rotation on OB uh, that I thought was the greatest thing because I had just come off a six-week rotation on hematology, oncology, and I saw a lot of chemotherapy and even death. And then the next rotation, I'm up at four in the morning delivering a baby or assisting. We, we called it delivering a baby in those days. Now we call it catching, but you know, the proper term would be uh, catching babies. And I thought that was the greatest thing. So at that point, I was very naive. I didn't understand about the economics, the liability, the hours. So, you know, most medical students are are, are very um, optimistic about things. And so I chose OB as my residency. I 
did my residency at Cedar sinai in Los Angeles, where as part of our training, we spent four months uh, at L.A. County, USC in the early 80s. When I trained, it was the busiest hospital in the country. And so I got exposed to all kinds of things that a lot of other people, other residency programs, and currently, and currently obviously, physicians are not being exposed to, like breaches and twins and forceps and vacuums and and uh, doing breach extractions. And it was really a great training ground, which is sort of not available anymore. And then I came out thinking that I was the hottest thing around since sliced bread because I knew everything about obstetrics, uh, only to be asked by some midwives to be their backup physician, which, of course, in those days I was building my practice. And I said, sure, because it was just more business for me. And I really didn't think too much of it one way or the other. But slowly over the next decade, I began to see that there's an entirely new way of doing things with people that don't have a problem. And so I um, uh, began to alter the way I did things. I actually made a collaborative practice for 15 years with two certified nurse midwives in Ventura County called The Woman's Place. And we had really good statistics and we were doing everything, but it was midwife model of care, which was you know, more attentive to uh, prenatal visits, nutrition, stress reduction, uh, exercise, well-being, pre- pregnancy as wellness, not pregnancy as disease, which is what, you know, OB residents are taught. And I began to incorporate that into my practice. And the more I did that, or oh, as the years went by, the more resistance I got from the mainstream medical community. And that included the OB department, the administration of the hospitals I worked at, and specifically the like anesthesia department and the pediatric department did not like some of the things that our clients wanted. Uh, did not like the way we allowed people to have choice and make uh, have some input into their own decisions. Um, and it became sort of con- uh, conflicted. And at some point, it was going to come to a head. And it was, it was my choice to leave the hospital-based world because they weren't going to allow me to practice the things that I was trained to do that were evidence-based that ultimately... Uh, are a woman's right to choose and being, after she's given a true informed consent. I realized that that for years, and, and what's going on in the obstetrical world right now, is that women are not given informed consent. They're given skewed informed consent, and uh, or not even, sometimes it's just they're even told what to do, and they don't know enough to ask the questions or what rights they have. And so there's a violation of ethics that goes on pretty much every day in every hospital uh, in the maternity wards across the country. And as a single person, it's really hard to change. And I really couldn't acquiesce to it. So I started working in home birthing. And I've been doing home birthing now for six years, after uh, 30 years in the hospital-based world. Actually, 28 years, to be accurate. And uh, I've never been happier regarding my ability to provide choices to the women and their families that I was being restricted on in a hospital setting. Well, let's talk more about that, about pregnancy as disease versus as a wellness process. I mean, that's that's just a powerful concept right there that would really um, change the way a pregnancy goes based on the birth provider you're with. Well, um, mammalian birth is a normal physiologic function of the of the females of the species in all mammals. All right, you a baby grows and a baby uh, and woman go into labor without thinking about it. Is a is it a physiologic function like breathing? or digestion. You really don't have to think about it. Only when something goes wrong, like when you get colitis or if you get asthma, do you need to see a physician. But most of the time, we don't go to a medical doctor to, you know, to digest our dinner. All right. So you look at, a, a, you know, it's a simplistic way of looking at it, but it is sort of, um, it, it is sort of, it, in most pregnancies, we don't need medical intervention. And the problem is, is, you know, if, whether it's 80% or 85% of women who don't need medical intervention, doctors are only trained in dealing with women who have medical, um, as if they have a medical problem. You know, they're, they're, they're admitted to the hospital. Uh, who goes to the hospital? You know, sick people go to the hospital. They're, uh, they are filling out forms that talk about surgery and death. They're asked to pee in a cup. They're asked to, you know, uh, sign consent forms, and they're asked to... Uh, lay in bed, strapped to a monitor, and ask permission to go to the bathroom. They're constantly interrupted. They're not allowed to eat. This is not how other mammals do well. And the midwifery model honors the normality of birth and only refers out when something becomes abnormal as opposed to the other way around. Um, That's the way 
uh, I think that it should be looked at, and it's pretty easy if you're giving good prenatal care to keep women healthy. And when something isn't obvious, then midwives are very good at recognizing that because they're experts in normal birthing, whereas obstetricians are experts in abnormal birthing. And why are we having experts in something that's abnormal taking care of the 85% of women who aren't abnormal? It is a question that no one bothers to ask. Uh, And that gets me to a whole other subject about the training of physicians these days and the lack of the lack of training them to be truly obstetricians. What makes an obstetrician unique, Jay, is um, the ability to do a breech delivery or put forceps on or pull out a second twin. Um, if all, all doctors are doing are va- catching vaginal birth deliveries or doing cesarean sections, you really, you really are making the profession of obstetrician sort of obsolete. Hmm. And the midwives, obstetricians currently really aren't being trained in any of those things. Right, so why do we need them? What do they do that a midwife can't do or that a general surgeon can't do or that a family practice doctor can't do if they're not doing the things that make obstetricians unique? And if you have a woman in your office who has a GYN cancer, she goes to a GYN oncologist. If she has a bladder problem, she goes to a GYN urologist. If she has a high-risk pregnancy, she goes to a maternal fetal medicine specialist. Um, Why do we, what, what, what does the average GYN do in his office? You know, routine stuff. Who can do that? Nurse practitioners can do that. Midwives can do that. Um, the thing that makes us unique is really our skill in the in the delivery room, and they're not training that anymore. And that was a, that was part of the problem of why I left the hospital because they were beginning to ban reasonable choices like midwives and vaginal birth after cesarean or VBAC, and breech delivery or twin delivery, and they were making it very difficult. And even the policies and the protocols that they have, even if they allow a woman to do a VBAC in their hospital, make the chance of success much less because you're restricting a mammal and you're, uh, you know, anytime there's restriction or anxiety or interruption, labor often becomes dysfunctional. And then you end up with that whole cascade that I'm sure your listeners are aware of with the, you know, the, inter- the induction, the epidural, the Pitocin, the fetal distress, the, thank God we have an operating room down the hall and we saved your baby. Right. And so many women go into into labor and into delivery thinking everything's okay simply because nothing was, quote, wrong in their prenatal care. And the only monitoring was the disease state rather than the wellness state and preparing them for it. And then they go into, as you said, I talk about that all the time with women. Like when you go into a hospital, innately, you're going to have a little bit of fear because... The only time you go into a hospital is if you're sick or you're, there's an emergency where a life-saving procedure needs to be done, and birth is not that. I totally, yeah. I mean, I, I, I just basically I agree with that 100%. I think it's, it's gotten to the point where you know, the wrong people are controlling birth in the, in the United States. Who do you right? think is birth- controlling the birth right now? Well, academicians in the American College of OBGYN um, – and they look at birth to the point that, you know, everything is a problem that needs to be solved. It really isn't that complicated in most of the, in most of the scenarios. It really is. I mean, for instance, Jay, you probably heard about this, but at the last ACOG meeting back east a few months ago, they had two guys supposedly in a debate. I always thought a debate was when one person has one view and the other person has another view. And it turns out these guys had the same view that all women should be induced at 39 weeks. Right. I remember reading about that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And they're always trying to fix things. And and their fixing things took a C-section rate of five percent in 1970, and has made it 32 percent in 19 in 2016. Hmm. And we really don't have much to show for that. I mean, the rate of cerebral palsy, the rate of neonatal death, hasn't significantly changed in the last 40 years. So why the 500 percent increase in cesarean sections? What has what have we accomplished? And worse yet, what have we what what have we done? What monster are we creating? What will we find in the future that we've done by by intervening in normal birth the way we have? Right. Well, and what is your experience now? I mean, you said you've been practicing more in a home birth uh, situation for the last six years versus twenty eight years in a in a medicalized um, birth environment. What are the what are the experiences? What are the outcomes that you're seeing now that you just weren't seeing in the hospital? Well, first of all, uh, home birth 
practitioners get to cherry pick their patients. So the, the you can't really compare outcomes directly. I mean, that would be like apples to oranges. That would be like what what you know a lot of papers do that are that are poorly written, where they compare a standardized procedure like a cesarean section to a non-standardized procedure like a vaginal breech delivery, and then say, oh look, the C-sections are better. You know, so I can't say that that because I get to cherry pick my clients and I get to spend, but I, my model of birth is different than the economic forces, the medical legal forces, the expedient forces allow in the, in the current medical model where, you know, for what you get reimbursed for the liability, for the way sh- your lifestyle is, you, you end up with a practice where you work a shift. You have to see a certain number of patients in order to meet your overhead and the diminishing return on insurance payments or Medi-Cal payments or whatever make it so that you can't possibly spend a half an hour or 45 minutes with each prenatal visit. So you your patients aren't as well prepared. They also go into the hospital not knowing whether the doctor that they've been seeing throughout their pregnancy is actually going to be on call. So you can't compare uh, the two directly. Having said that, I can tell you that my success rate with breach and VBAC and twins is much greater at home than it had, than it ever was in the hospital. Right. And that's simply because in the home, you know, we start with healthy people and we leave them alone and we don't mess with labor unless it needs to be in messed with. So in other words, women at home can move around, they can eat, they can get in the water, they can get on all fours, they can, you know, walk. They're not interrupted constantly. They're not uh, in a, they're in an environment that makes them feel very, very safe. It's hard to compare that, Jay, to the to what goes on in um, the hospital setting, where, like you, like we've talked about earlier, everybody's anxious. But the outcomes, I, I believe, the outcomes are better. Could could there be a potential problem that occurs at home that can't be handled as well at the hospital? Yes, there could be, but the numbers are small. And when people hear studies about home birth risk is greater than hospital risk, all right, again, you have to look at the ideology of the people that write the article, who's sponsoring the article. And then more importantly, and I've, I've done a podcast on this, I've written papers on this, people have to understand the difference between actual risk and relative risk. And there's a huge difference. Something may be three times riskier, but it still may be one in a million. All right. So the denominator matters. I always say that the denominator matters. And when people talk about the increased risk of a, of a problem at home, that may be slightly true. Uh, again, they're comparing apples to oranges because there's no way to control for everything that goes on in the home. But what I'm trying to say is that the, um, the risks, even though they might be slightly greater, are still extremely small. And, if, and it depends how that information is presented to the family. And if it's presented in a, in a, relative risk fashion, you're going to skew your counseling to get them to do what you want them to do, as opposed to giving them actual risk. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And it's something that I know from like my own experience. My son was born at home. Uh, he's three years old now. And we had an amazing birth experience. And it was an amazing experience because one, Effie was really healthy going into the pregnancy and during the pregnancy. And we had an amazing team around us that we could totally trust their support and their guidance during that labor process. And of course, as a parent and as the father, my protector comes up, you know, and I wanted to make sure if everything goes sound, but I also knew the the home was going to be the safest place for my baby to be born. And also, if something were to come up, our midwife would be able to say, okay, this is something we need to address. And like in the next hour or so, we need to transfer to the hospital rather than it being a 911 call. Now, of course, you can't control for everything, as you said. And I think that's what you mean by cherry picking your patients, right? Is that as you're taking a woman along throughout their prenatal, if there's something that shows they're not going to be a good candidate for the, the home birth, then you would give them to other appropriate providers. Is that what you mean? Yes. And I also mean in labor, since we're not meddling with labor, it's very, very, very rare for suddenly something to deteriorate rapidly. That happens more in the hospital because of the way way women are managed in the hospital. Hmm. And then you have the operating room available and, and that, you know, it's a good thing. I mean, the operating room is necessary, but 
you know, the World Health Organization says the C-section rate should be somewhere between 10 and 15 percent, Jay. Mm -hmm. And if we are if if we're doing 30, let's just say 30 percent because it's easier math, then that means we're doing twice the number of C-sections that we should be doing. Now, now we're doing about 1.3 million C-sections a year in the United States. It's the most commonly performed operation in the United States. And if we're actually doing half of them that it's unnecessary, that's 700,000 or 650,000 unnecessary surgeries. I mean, think about it. If we were doing 650,000 unnecessary gallbladder surgeries or knee surgeries, the, 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 world, the, the country would be in outrage. Right. And yet... There's not a peep out of this. Hmm. And then to think, I mean, too, of like if there's 1.3 uh, or say half, 1.3 million cesareans, half are unnecessary to think of, of those parents that want to have a second child or a third child or a subsequent child, then it's putting them at risk for that next um, birth that if they're not going for a VBAC, um, then it's, it's almost like we could be preventing a lot of VBACs. Well, yeah, if you can avoid the first C-section, that's the key. And the problem, like I said very er earlier in our discussion, they aren't training physicians to do the things to help women avoid the first C-section because they're not training women uh, breach and twin and forcep type deliveries, which is one way to lower your C-section rate. And they're also not training physicians to to be patient. I mean, two of the worst things that ever happened in, in obstetrics – are still relied on to this day, and that's the Friedman curve, which is sort of changing gradually, um, where women are all women are supposed to dilate at a certain rate, and if they're not, then you have to intervene. I mean, that's the most ridiculous thing that I can imagine. I mean, assuming that all women are supposed to follow a certain pattern in labor, and that's the way I was trained. And the second thing is is um, continuous fetal monitoring, which has never been shown to be effective in reducing cerebral palsy, but has absolutely been shown to increase the cesarean section rate because everybody's nervous because everybody's sitting there watching every single heartbeat that the baby has and every time there's a little blip which babies do all the time by the way um it starts to make people nervous mm -hmm. and once you start making people nervous you break that whole cascade comes into play of uh you know how mammals don't do well when they're anxious and then and then also you have the the whole thing with the with the home birth world, you have you have like you said with your with your team, you they were very nurturing and you knew them and you had a good relationship with them. Right. In the hospital model, first of all, you you may have a nurse that you first of all you, you hire a physician to do your OB to do your delivery. The primary caregiving during your labor is a nurse you've never met, who changes shift every twelve hours, and. Your doctor, who the one only one that you may have met throughout your pregnancy, may not even be on call. And if they, a person is on call, he or she doesn't show up until the baby, you know, until you're pushing. So you're being cared for by people that you never contracted with, that you have no relationship with. And by the way, in 12 hours, you can make a beautiful relationship with your labor nurse. But then guess what? Yeah. She goes home. Right. Yeah, and I think that's part of why here at Cap Wellness and with Dr. Cap's patients, uh, like Dr. Cap is your doc, and he's at ninety percent of the births that um, that he's taking care of of the women um, throughout their pregnancy. He also has his C-section rate is just under ten percent um, right now because he supports those kind of things around laboring at home for as long as possible and having a doula and when you're in the hospital to move around and to be in all kinds of different laboring positions and to allow birth to happen um, as it is. Like on the podcast, we've had Dr. Michelle O'Dont and um, Sarah Buckley who was talking about like birth should be unobserved and uninterrupted, just as you're saying, and all of those things get in the way. And in a hospital environment, there's obviously liabilities and protocols that um, they're needing to follow. And so making sure a woman's educated and empowered with their choices within that is something that we take very seriously here. This podcast is about that and all the education that we're doing. And so, you know, the women that you're working with, I'm sure are doing the same thing of being very involved and asking a lot of questions and maybe even being prompted by you to think of some things that they never had. And that's comes with a prenatal, uh, care plan that actually allows the doc to have time with them, which sounds like you yeah. have much more time with them now, but than you did before. Absolutely, I do, and and uh, it, it and it's and the job satisfaction is something that you know you you can't belittle um, every aspect of this. And I I don't know many happy obstetricians. I would bet Doctor Cap 
is probably a pretty happy obstetrician, other than the fact that, you know, uh, it does affect our lifestyles. I mean, part of the reason we've gone to shift medicine and, and laborists and those sorts of things is because of the horrible, uh, you know, I, the horrible feeling of being on call 24-7. Yes. And, and it wears on you after a while, and, and it certainly disrupts your social life and your, and your family life. And, uh, you know, it's not, it's not ideal. But ultimately, uh, you know, you have to be happy in what you do. And I think when you are happy in what you do, you, you're, you, you do a better job at it. Yes. And I just know that when I used to work, uh, when I was younger and, and, and building my practice, I would take shifts at like, like um, Inglewood Hospital or, or St. John's Hospital in Santa Monica, and I'd cover the ER for 12 hours. And I would end up taking care of people I'd never met before. And, and uh, you know, I, I actually didn't like it. Hmm. I didn't like it. I like the relationship aspect of the midwifery model of care. And I think that even if you ask midwives who work in a shift model like at UCLA or or other places, I, I think that they love their work because they're midwives and they do it for a calling. But, but ultimately, I, I think it's got to be hard for them to care for somebody for 12 hours, and she's just starting to push, and then they go home. Right. I mean, it, it leaves you sort of incom- incomplete. So the model has to change, Jay, and I don't know that it will ever change because the people that control the purse strings control the model. But I, I and I've said this before too. I mean, 20, 20 years ago, when you went to the grocery store, you had Ralphs and you had Vons. Albertsons, okay, and the food was food, and that was just the way it was. You bought a potato, it was just a potato, all right, and then Whole Foods and other places like Sprouts and other places popped up, and suddenly you had better food and organic food, and and uh, in order to compete, Ralphs and Vons had to go and have an organic section and and have a uh, have a, a lunch section where you could get you know, gourmet food and come in and get a tray full of it for a, a reasonable price and eat your lunch there and get some good food like Whole Foods did. And so Whole Foods changed the whole grocery market. Ultimately, wouldn't it be nice if we had somebody, an entrepreneur, come in and change the labor market so that you had to make hospitals change their model so that they could compete with something outside where women could come in labor and be able to walk around and be able to be left alone but be in a place where maybe there was an operating room or an anesthesiologist nearby or something, but they weren't, you know, they didn't walk in and sign a bunch of consent forms that, that, uh, and liability and risk managers weren't running the hospital, uh, or the, or the birth center, whatever you want to call it. I mean, I don't want to confuse it with birth centers, but I'm talking about a different paradigm, setting up a whole new paradigm for normal birth in the United States. I mean, we're talking about a huge market. We're talking about 85% of the 4 million births every year in the United States. Right. Somebody, that, that idea is going to get into somebody's head. Right. Um, who can make it happen? I, I don't have the background or the knowledge or the, you know, the connections to make that happen. But, but sooner or later, there will be somebody who has a wife or a, or a baby or a daughter or whatever who, who has an experience that they've realized that this needs to be propagated. I mean, a lot of celebrities and other people talk about their home birth experience and it gets put out there but it's met with some joy and some acceptance but it's also met with a lot of ridicule right. there's a lot of anger and ridicule and what i'd like to end with or like one of my messages today is about informed choice but it's also about res- mutual respect and collaboration i mean why why do physicians why are they so threatened by midwives i mean and why are they so threatened by you know, they're supposed to be able to take care of people with problems, and but they don't want to. And so when a woman tries to choose to have a home birth and then develops a, a non-life-threatening problem, sometimes we go to the hospital with that woman and they're met with disdain and uh, inc- incredulity. And it's so inappropriate. I, I, I've actually seen the rudeness and the inappropriateness and the unprofessional, beha- unethical behavior of some hospital physicians and occasional hospital nurses who are so hostile to the midwives uh, and occasionally to me when we transport somebody in who needs help. I mean, a collaboration is the best way to do things. Midwives are well-trained in normal birthing. And in the, in the British system or whatever else, the first choice for women is to go to a midwife. And then if there's a problem, then only the doctor comes in. And that's, that's a, that system seems to have better results and better outcomes. And so ultimately... You know, it would be nice to have mutual respect. I don't expect physicians to 
want to do what I do or understand what I do or do what midwives do. A lot of the younger guys, they don't have the training. And if all you've ever known in your life has been the hospital model with the anesthesiologist and the NICU team down the hall and it makes you feel secure, the idea of delivering babies in someone's home has got to be freaky beyond belief. And I get that. But it doesn't mean that they have to disrespect those of us that do it. Right. And I think going back to what you're saying about the model changing and the paradigm changing, if it came from the hospital system, if it came from the medical system, that would be incredible. And I would jump on board with that. But really, it's going to come from the grassroots and it's going to come from the parents making different choices. And just in the same way that Whole Foods was able to succeed and then force Ralph's and Vaughn's to create um organic sections in their stores. It was people actually going to Whole Foods and paying for those foods and um, voting with their dollars in that way that then the market needed to react and the paradigm needed to be shifted. So I think things like you're doing with your podcast, um, just getting this type of information out to just plant a seed of a woman that might have thought that she didn't have any power, any choice to then start asking questions and learning more about it. Not necessarily switching birth providers, although that might happen, but really go into it more empowered and help change it from within rather than waiting for the hospitals to change it. Yeah, the hospitals aren't going to change it because they're economically invested in the system that, as it is right now. And let me give you an example. I mean, what if, what if before Whole Foods came into California, that Vons and Ralph's and Gelson's, whatever, they all went to Sacramento and they, and they lobbied Sacramento and the legislature there to prevent organic food from being sold, all right? People, would, people laugh at that analogy, but that's sort of what happens in the medical world, is that every decision regarding a midwife has to be approved by the American College of OBGYN and the California Medical Association. Why is that? I mean, midwifery is not a poor, poor, poor stepchild of obstetrics. Midwifery is a separate profession, and yet it's ruled over and loaded over by the American College of OBGYN. For instance, you know, there are many, many talented midwives out there who have done breech delivery all their career. And suddenly, because midwives wanted to be slightly autonomous from, from OBs, the OBs lobbied Sacramento to take away the right of midwives to do breeches and twins. Or to do a woman at 42 weeks in one day, or 36 weeks in six days. Why do you, why did they have to do that? Do they think they're the only arbiters of safety? Do do Ralphs and Vons think that they're the only arbiters of good food? No. But there's a huge economic interest, and anybody who wants to try to change that is going to have to deal with the fact that that um, what goes on in our world is affected by what goes on in places like Sacramento and in Washington and other places where they make these rules that take away our choices. And again, this gets back to personal liberty and, and informed consent. And the right of informed consent includes the right of informed refusal. And most physicians and most hospitals do not respect that. They make it very hard and there's, there's coercion and there's threat, there's threats with child protective services and, you know, and they pull out the dead baby card and say, well, if you don't do what we say, your baby's going to be, you know, injured. I mean, once you say that to a mother, you have you have no choice. There's got to be a better way to talk to women. There's got to be a better way to to deliver care. It's why it's why the home birth uh, world is rising, because people are people are smart enough to understand that the hospital isn't giving them these choices. I mean, it's not rising fast enough for my liking, uh, because as you said, competition. Will, is the only thing that will make these places change. But there needs to be a change because something has happened to birth in this country. We, uh, the outcomes are not any better, and the C-section rate is astronomically high. Right. So the call really is for parents to get much more educated and not just go along with the status quo. And I know like, your podcast is doing that. Your Facebook page is full of not information, but even just stories of like what you're doing. So to tell our listeners how they can, uh, you know, follow along and learn more about what you're doing and your model of things. Well, I, I published a paper last year, which you can find at the very top header of my website, uh, which is birthinginstincts.com. It's called Home Birth with an Obstetrician, a series of 135 out of hospital births. It's a clinical series. It is not a scientific paper. It doesn't have statistical significance because it's not 
a large enough series. It's going to be hard to replicate because there are very few physicians left that do what I do. But my website is birthinginstincts.com, and they can see a little bit more about what I do there. There's links right off of that to my podcast, which we try to publish one every week. Um, and we try to do it on timely issues that have to do with um, OBGYN, nursing, pediatrics, breastfeeding. Uh, but sometimes we go off on topics. So one of my favorite podcasts was uh, about my daughter when she was 17 wanted to go to Coachella. So we ended up talking about whether to send a 17-year-old to Coachella or not to go to Coachella. <laughs> um, I didn't hear but, that one. <laughs> yeah, it's an older one with my old with my old co-host Brian. But um, that's one place. The Doctor Stu's podcast is another place uh, they can find me. And then I um, I'm on Facebook. Uh, the usual places. I, I, I try to stay away from Facebook these days. It's gotten too political. Hmm. Uh, hopefully that'll be over soon. Right. <laughs> well, I'll make sure right. I uh, add in all those links so listeners can um, go to there and uh, get especially the paper and also just uh, explore your website some more. Yeah, the bottom line for women is to just, just understand that this the birth is not a disease, that, that birth is wellness unless it isn't. And when you're, And your doctor a lot of times is more scared of your pregnancy than you are. And they project their fear onto you. And so if you feel like your doctor is nervous about it, or doesn't give you the time, or doesn't give you the answers to the questions, or makes you feel small, um, don't hesitate to find another one. Seek out a second opinion. Uh, talk to a midwife. Uh, you know, Find out whether you're a candidate for a birth. There's midwives that work in hospitals. There are midwives that work out of hospital. Uh, if you feel safer in a hospital, that's where you should be. But but safety is a canard sometimes that 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 um, people use to force you to do stuff that you may not want to do. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is a French philosopher, Albert Camus, who says, the welfare of humanity is always the alibi of tyrants. And uh, you can take, you can just ask, stop and think about that for a second. Wow. Well, that's a powerful message. I mean, to really get informed, find a birth provider that's going to support you and what the way you want to bring your baby into the world in the safest most natural way. Well, Dr. Stu, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. You're welcome, Jay. Thank you for joining us today. For more information about this episode and other natural childbirth and parenting topics, please visit us at capwellnesscenter.com or message us on our Facebook page with any questions you might have. We here at the Cap Wellness Center look forward to helping you and your family be as happy and healthy as you can be.